uh, sort of figured this out yet. So it's going to take some time for the market to catch on to this uh, problem. Okay. So the problem that you guys are having is because the Nifty is going down. Okay. Or most of the stocks are are declining. So this understand that, that this is a standard problem that you're going to face in any uh, professional money management situation. Okay. Um, let's try and I'm not going to change the. Um, I'm worried about the internet, so I'm not changing the uh, setting, uh, the the granularity here, or the ticker. Okay. So uh, the point is, the problem that you guys are having is that uh, the Nifty, I mean, the broad index is declining, which is the broad. Most of the stocks are declining because the index is nothing but an average. Okay. So now the problem is, ideally, in a in a in a global market setting, because you are supposed to learn finance from a global markets perspective. Okay. So if we pull out your uh, asset classes. We'll soon find out how good the connection is. Yeah. So from a global markets perspective, this is not a problem per se. The markets are going down, okay? Because you are supposed to learn to go either long or short, depending on your view. So if you have the, view, if you are able to detect that the markets are going down, which means you have a bearish view, so you should be comfortable going short. And then obviously, when you're, when you feel the market is going up, you should be comfortable going long. And this applies to all the asset classes. So remember that when we are learning finance, as far as possible, we are trying to learn in such a way that we learn about the general principles which are applicable to all asset classes and all markets and all asset classes. Okay, that's why I don't uh, teach from in the from just from a stock markets and bond markets point of view, or in most cases in investing classes we are taught only from a stock market point of view. That is not correct because it does not give you the perspective that you can apply the same principles in all markets, currency markets, commodity markets. Okay, all the markets are all markets are the same in many ways. So to the extent that there are general principles, you should learn them as general principles applicable to all markets. So in general, in all markets, the gen the rule that applies is you should not have a problem problem with markets going down or up if they're going down you should just be comfortable going short as a general principle now the problem that you're facing is because we have now restricted you to certain markets okay you can't you're not free in this project to trade in any particular asset class that you want to right so we have restricted you and now you find that the markets to which you have been restricted so you have been essentially put into this okay so if you see you are at the intersection of spot and equities okay so you are in this box so i have forcibly put you in this box because this is what happens in many investment situations that this particular decision as to which asset class to invest in which market to invest in what type of instruments to invest in uh, what type of instruments to use okay these decisions are typically made by the investor so you are also finding a little bit about some of these decision problems okay so these are typically made by the investor, the person who is financing your, uh, you know, your uh, fund. Okay. So I have put all kinds of restrictions on you. I have confined you to the asset class that we call equities. Within that, I have confined you only to spot instruments. I'm not letting you trade in futures or options. Okay. I've forbidden you from trading in those. So you're only able to trade what we call cash equities. Okay. Cash equities as in cash is distinguished from, remember here that when we distinguish between uh, the underlying markets and the derivatives markets, we also sometimes use the expression cash markets. So when you're listening to business television, you may find very often that they use the, how are the cash markets doing? Okay. So, or the derivatives or the futures are, a dis, are at a discount to cash. If you tune into Bloomberg at the, just before the US market opens, okay, maybe a couple of hours before the US market uh, opens, because the US equity index futures are so liquid that they trade around the clock. So they are trading all the time. And so when the US anchors come in early morning, say 7.30 or so US uh, New York time, they will be looking at the futures to see uh, how the cash market is likely to open. Okay, so you have equity index futures in the US and they trade around the clock. So you can already see even when it's like the US markets will open at 9.30 New York time. But uh, even at 7, 7.30 New York time, you can see the futures are trading around the clock. Okay, so if you can see here, uh, you can actually see those tickers even here. So you have a ticker called ES, which is the E-mini equity index futures. Right, you can see here E-mini S&P 500, Globex. What you want to see are the futures. 
so this is one of the and right now we are in august right so we will look at the september futures okay so you can see this here okay from uh, the last closing they are up about eight points so the u.s equity uh, futures market is uh, is pointing to a higher open at this point okay so this is the e-mini s p index futures it's a small contract but it's very actively traded you can see how actively traded it is you'll see all i mean you see 24 into 5 you see this trades at a one tick spread that one tick on this particular contract is 0.25 Whenever you look at it, even if you look at it at the time of the Wellington Open when New York has closed, you will find this contract has a one tick spread. Yes, sir. One tick tick is basically the minimum increment. Remember, in Indian equities, you are looking at five paise. Yes. Okay, you can't trade in one pay, uh, three paisa, one paisa. Okay, so this is the tick. This is called the tick size. The tick size is the minimum increment. So when you go from twenty eight, uh, this. 288.75 the next price has to be it can't be 288.77 the next price has to be 288 point uh, basically uh, not 0.75 so 288 to 2889 next price has to be 2889 so you can see that's why I'm saying this is always trading at a one tick spread although these are US in US equity index futures the US is nowhere near open at this point of time okay but it's still you can see it's always trading at a one tick spread this is because this market is very liquid and it's a global market and there are no restrictions on uh, trading in equity index futures in the US I mean you can be in Wellington and you can trade them you can be in Saudi Arabia and trade them there are no restrictions okay so therefore there's a lot of participation in the market it's very very liquid okay so the advantage as you can see straight away is lower transaction costs because the bid offer spread is very tight in fact they maintain the best possible bid offer spread around the clock essentially is everyone following so what is this uh, this is a future uh, this is a future contract or this is a share first of all we should not use the expression future contract we should say futures okay so even one contract is a futures contract okay so that's the expression that we use yeah what is your question this is a few yeah this is a futures contract okay if you want to learn more about this contract you can go to the CME group website and look under equity you will see this it's important to know about this contract this is one of the major global contracts okay like along with oil okay gold so if you look at some of the major US uh, major global contracts would be this CL CL is what what is CL the code for West Texas intermediate crude oil okay you can see this light sweet fruit oil uh, NYMEX if you look at this so here you're already looking at some of the most uh, so in crude oil we won't take the September August uh, let's take October okay and uh, then you can see so so you already have crude oil you have the S&P 500 futures you can look at gold which is GC gold trades mainly in the spot market but it's a pretty active futures contract as well as you will see this is the NYMEX uh, this is the COMEX gold um, they have now made this a part of the uh, gold we should trade August we won't trade August but we'll it's a little bit out okay all right okay so you can see here gold is a little bit wider okay but uh, then you can see how tight the crude oil market is again this is a US benchmark crude okay this is West Texas intermediate means this crude has to be delivered in uh, Cushing Oklahoma so the underlying grade of crude oil for this for which this is a price that has to be delivered in Cushing Oklahoma so it's a US contract it's a US oil contract but you can see how tight it is why is it so tight the spread because it's a global contract there are no restrictions on investing okay so there's part of participation from all over the world which makes it very liquid so even this is this contract also if you look even early in Wellington time this will still be trading most of the time at a one tick spread okay here the tick side is here the tick size is one cent so you can see how different contracts have different tick sizes is everyone clear about the tick size concept so in every market this is one of the things you have to look at what is a tick size okay you have to be aware of these things when you trade a particular market okay so essentially what you're seeing is uh, this is what happens in developed markets you have a lot of liquidity you have comfort level with short selling futures anyway you can go short okay so um, 
maybe one of the things we'll have next time is I'll let you go short uh, nifty uh, futures okay if you see the the nifty index futures for this project you continue this way as you as you are doing the as you as you're doing now with cash equities but one of the ways to get around this is to have selling in the futures market to to be able uh, to have the ability to sell in the futures market yes uh, sir you were saying in crude oil uh, it would be point uh, point one cent I think so yeah so it one. yeah one cent point one cent sir. not point one cent point zero one dollars point zero one dollars which is one cent no sir point zero zero one dollars yeah actually that you're right it's point zero zero one dollars that's i think that's what we do i don't remember exactly now but i think it was that so sometimes you have an option of selling to quoting to the third decimal okay good good memory okay so uh, for this for some reason we have delayed data i don't know why we have delayed data for this okay yeah because uh, we are not subscribed to this this is a nifty trading account only this is only a indian equities uh, indian equities trading account so the only thing where we'll have live data other than indian equities is foreign exchange okay so if you want to look at the, some of the major uh, major markets in the world these are some of the major markets in the world and this is basically it okay so if you look at some, you're looking at some of the major markets in the world in terms of active vol, you know very active markets being traded around the clock so you have these two foreign exchange markets we can maybe you can also include uh, you know sterling usd that's cable and maybe even the uh, australian dollar okay canadian dollar some of these major contracts so these are very liquid markets the currency markets so you have one equity index futures and then the other one which i have not given here is um, I forget what the I think the T note code is uh, ZN. Yeah, ten year um, futures. Okay, so here you are looking at a few major asset classes, and here we are going to trade. Uh, okay, we can still look at September. Okay, so here you're looking at some of the major markets in the world. Okay, so you've got the U.S. 10-year uh, Treasury note. Okay, you can see this, the 10-year U.S. Treasury note. This is a debt. Which asset class is this? In terms of our asset classes, Treasury. U.S. 10-year Treasury note goes into which asset class? Debt. 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 Okay. So this basically this thing. Let me just make this a little smaller so we can see everything here okay i make it a little bit smaller even more okay yeah so this 10-year notes futures goes into this box can you see this so we are once again playing with this framework to help you to understand some of the major markets in the world okay which is so you are going into this debt and the intersection of debt and futures so this is a debt futures contract it's very active okay there are some other active futures like the bond futures which is the german bond german government bond but we can take this as the most active this is definitely by by a wide margin this is the most active futures uh, debt futures contract the sovereign debt futures contract in the world okay so you can see if you look at the uh, some of the major liquid uh, major equity uh, major markets in the world you have one uh, from debt you have another from equities okay s p 500 uh, uh, e-money futures contract okay so you have one from equities one from debt then you have two from commodities crude oil and gold okay you can probably add copper also here if you want to insert uh, so it's just we can also add copper okay uh, we can go on in this manner but I'm just trying to since we are going through this exercise okay um, copper we'll just look at September okay so here you see that you have three commodity markets you have one equity index futures market you can add some other equity index futures also there's a Nasdaq uh, there's a Nasdaq index in the US so there's a futures contract on the Nasdaq as well which is quite uh, active also okay so you can add that as well so you have two equity index futures con two equity contracts three commodity contracts two foreign exchange contracts and what debt contract okay that gives you an idea of how uh, so what are the what are the major liquid markets in the world okay and most of these we are looking in the form of uh, we are looking at futures contracts and most of these cases except for these two where will these two go the euro dollar effects and the dollar yen effects the dollar yen we don't have to say effects where will they go Currency. currencies and which instrument Which instrument? Futures. 
Futures. No, these are not futures contracts. Yeah. And the clue is that, see, whenever I was posting futures contracts, whenever I was calling the tickers for futures contracts, what was happening? They were giving me a choice of months. Did you notice that? Yes, I said I won't take August, I'll take because of gold and all, I didn't want to take the near month. In copper also, I didn't want to take the near month. So in a futures, the dead giveaway is that in a futures contract, the system is going to ask you because there are many futures contracts listed at a point of time. Okay, so the system is going to ask you which futures contract do you want? You want August, September, December, November, what? Okay, so uh, that's the dead giveaway. In the case of the euro dollar FX and the dollar yen, it never asked me any of those questions. That, that's because these are the tickers for the spot contracts. Okay, so these are these are spot contracts essentially. Okay, so here these two go into this box. Similarly, if you trade, uh, if you added uh, GBP, USD, USD, CHF in this manner, USD dot CHF, etc. Okay, uh, that, that would all go into all those things would go into this box. Remember, I already told you once before that how are you going to use this framework inside this box? You imagine all the possible currency pairs you can think of in the world. NC2 with N is equal to once N equal to 169 or something like that. Okay, so NC2 that many pairs you can imagine inside this box with a comma after USD JPY comma Euro USD comma and so on and so forth. That's how you should think about this. Okay, so these are the markets that are uh, that sort of live inside this box. So what I have done for you now is I have boxed you into this spot equities i have spot boxed you into this okay and uh, so this this is meant to actually cover because there, there are futures uh, everywhere so maybe for the sake of this discussion i'll just uh, stop this uh, where is the i just want to Well, I'm not getting that. It doesn't matter anyway. So I put you here essentially, okay, in this box. I put you under spot equities, and further, I have confined you to only one part of this box because this box has spot equities in every possible country in the world. So this box has uh, Japanese spot equities. So this box contains even if you're trading Toyota Motor common stock on the Osaka Stock Exchange, that will fall in this box. If you're trading uh, ICI PLC stock on the London Stock Exchange, that also would fall under this box. Okay. So inside this box, you have to really imagine because you're looking at spot equities. So you have to then create certain sub boxes inside this box for each country that has a pretty well developed equity market. So you have UK, US, uh, Japan, Canada, all these countries. So inside this box, you have to imagine all these sub boxes, one for each country. So now I have confined you to one of the sub boxes within this box. <coughs> I have confined you to Indian equities and further even within Indian equities, I have further confined you to only the Nifty 50. So I've created another small sub box inside the Indian sub box. Are you following what I'm doing? Yes, How the markets are being constricted. Okay. So this is typically what the investor will do in any fund. Okay. The investor is giving you money will give you typically give you some restrictions. Otherwise, sometimes the money manager himself will when he's launching the fund, he himself will say that I will invest only in these kinds of markets, only with these kinds of instruments and then people will subscribe to his fund. Okay. So either way it happens, but usually it's the investor who determines all these matters. So the question of which asset class to invest in, which instruments to use and which markets to invest in is typically decided by the investor. Okay. But you should be aware that these are decision problems. Technically, if I just give you a pool of money, if I just give you a million dollars and I say, okay, invest it for me. Then you see that you still have to make these decisions. Do you see that? As a practical matter, when you go about investing, you still have to take these decisions. Yes. Which asset class, because you can't possibly be trading it. It's pretty, you can still do it if you have a big enough team, but it's pretty difficult. As you can see, even with trading 50 nifty stocks, you can see it's pretty difficult to manage it on your own, right? Okay, so uh, therefore you have to take a decision on which asset class to be in, which instruments to use, okay, and which uh, markets to be in, okay. So you can see already within, even if you decide to trade Indian equities, you still have to take that decision. Should I confine myself just to Nifty 50 stocks or should I even make it even tighter and make it only the 30 BSE Sensex stocks? 
I, if you want to have an even smaller set, you can even take that decision. So the point is, these are all decisions. So asset class, instrument and market, these decisions have to be taken. These are actually decision problems that you have to resolve. Okay, everyone understands what a decision problem is? Yes. Sir. Okay, yeah. So, okay, so just be a, so now we are coming to back to this problem of what is happening here in the Indian markets where you have uh, because the market is coming down and then most of the stocks are coming down so you have a problem what do you buy uh, technically as i said to start out with in, in from a global perspective we don't really care whether the markets are going up or down okay because we are prepared to go go long or go short depending on our view as a general principle but then what happens is that so the entire discussion that we had was to talk about markets and to flavor, get a flavor of different kinds of markets worldwide okay and so different markets being in different states of development you may find that in this as you find yourself in this particular Indian equities trading situation you find that although in principle you are happy to go short but as a practical matter it's not possible to go short because most of the shares are not available for borrowing okay so when you try to go short the system is telling you not enough shares are available for uh, you know borrowing at this stage right so therefore if essentially what it means is for all practical purposes you can't go short in Indian equities you can't run a large fund with a short uh, bias okay so essentially you are confined to a long only fund okay this is clear to everyone you understand what is a lot you heard this expression long only have you heard the expression long only okay long only means that the the fund if it's a long only fund it means that the fund is confined to uh, the fund is confined to only long positions okay the investor mandate is such that the fund has been confined to long positions which means essentially the investor has told the fund manager you cannot go net short you have to be a long only fund which means your positions have to be either square which means either you're in all cash or you have some cash and some long equities you can't make any short you know, can't go net short equities you understand what net short is <coughs> net short means that you start out with a short position okay no yeah no short selling is allowed basically that's what it is good good that you have learned to use the terms uh, you have learned to use the terms uh, that uh, the technical terms of finance okay Okay, so we had some of this stuff here. Okay. Today is, we've missed one day. So today is 8-8, eight, eight, right? Okay, 8-8-8. Eight, 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 uh, eight is a big, 8 is a auspicious number in which culture? Do you know that? In Chinese culture, 8 is very... Means infinity, infinity and infinity. Okay, in that, that's what it means in Chinese? Yes, sir. Okay. In Chinese horoscope also. Okay, because the Chinese are very big on 8. So if you go to a condo in any Chinese dominated city like Singapore or Hong Kong, the 8th floor commands a premium price. So <laughs> 8 is a big... Uh, thumb. So it's 8-8. Eight, eight. Okay. Alright. So what is the... What were we discussing? What was I discussing? Long only. Okay. So there's a long only concept of a long only fund which means essentially this, uh, this is the investor mandate which tells you that you can't go net short okay so effectively you guys are running although I never put any restriction on you I've allowed you to run a long short fund okay I allowed you to run a long short equity fund but for all practical purposes you're running a long only fund okay so here you have two choices if you have a bearish view on the market okay in general or if you for any particular stock then if you have a bearish view and you don't have the flexibility to go short okay uh, then in that case the next best thing is to stay in cash okay better not to buy anything okay and lose money rather stay in cash which you will hear in many discussions when the market is going down okay in many discussions you have this situation where um, the fund managers who are appearing on TV they might they, they might get asked how much are you in all cash or what is your cash position right now okay so the answer there would be something like 10% we are in 10 we are 10% in cash or 40% in cash which means like 10% or 40% of the cat of the fund is in cash okay so which is which will 40 percent in cash would be considered a very high cash allocation for an equity fund which means they don't they are bearish on the market and they can't go short or they don't have a view okay typically most of the funds are long only so therefore uh, they it means essentially that I they are expecting a further drop in the market okay is this clear so you have this discussion about cash levels of funds 
okay so the next best option you have is to go uh, is to uh, be in uh, in cash not to buy okay that's your next best option okay and then the other option that you have is you have a total universe of 50 stocks right so it's not that every as you can see here all the while the market is declining tcs has been climbing yes okay and that we discussed yesterday some of the other equity uh, it stocks are also climbing okay so yeah so therefore it's your duty to find now this is a typical dilemma that you will face what you're facing here is a you're getting a first hand feel of the problems that, that you'll face in the real world if you go into investment management that you will have uh, situations like this okay which as you know this is a real situation it's not a simulation you are seeing what is actually happening in the markets so now uh, you will have a you will be managing a long only fund and you'll have this problem so you have to solve this problem by finding out which of those 50 stocks if TCS is going up then there's a chance that some other stuff is also going up just you find those stocks find the stocks which are likely to go up maybe adjust your time frame okay maybe trade very short term okay you have to adapt basically you have to essentially adapt because there's no uh, fixed formula which will not always work so as the market condition changes you have to adapt okay so you have to find ways to adapt so this is why i say that this is one of the most important parts of your learning you'll have this kind of a project in every course that to try and develop uh, to, to to get a feel for how market prices actually move and then process the news flow as well you should be following the news and then you're trying to find out how like some of the problems that Chug was facing that there must be some way to figure out that you know, based on this fundamental news the market should move this way so as you go through these problems you will experience them firsthand that how to uh, understand the market price movement in the context of the news flow okay so this is a real life problem and then you first you got again you're getting a first hand first hand familiarity with you're getting first hand exposure to uh, this kind of a problem that there's a certain amount of news coming out certain type of news is coming out markets are moving in a particular way now you have to find stocks which are going up okay and you're always going to face these uh, problems in this you're effectively managing a long only fund so you go through your universe of 50 stocks and you have to do it every day because maybe see if you see when i bought pcs i bought it around this time then for a while it went down and then it started going up so you have to watch it every day you can't just say okay i bought it here it's going down so i, I give up and i want to go home so you have to watch it every day because the situation is changing all the time right so you have to see if there's any price movement which uh, is called should cause you to change your actions this is clear so you have to monitor those 50 markets every day it's a rolling thing and it might even be multiple times a day depending on your time frame if you're trading in a very short time frame uh, with a very short time frame you have to trade it uh, to tackle it multiple times you have to run the same analysis on the same market multiple times a day depends on your time frame okay is this clear to everyone so this is the problem that you have then there's no easy fix to this problem now you figure out how to fix this problem so what this experience will give you hopefully is that first-hand feel and every person will evolve their own way of solving this kind of problem and that is exactly how it should be because there's no this is not science so therefore the you have to evolve your own way of managing this problem okay so you have to figure out how exactly do you manage in these kind of situations where you're facing this problem of a general downtrend in the market but you are forced to run a long only fund so which stocks can you buy keep desperately hunting for stocks that you can buy okay this is clear okay so now let me just show you one more element of uh, the uh, of the problem okay as you can see here now this particular thing now so some of the problem who was having that uh, problem of the um, actual unrealized pnl i think uh, chug had that problem uh, who was talking about no that was tarun okay tarun was talking about this so if you go to account you wanted to see your actual unrealized pnl right if you go to your account okay now everybody look at this so that you can figure out so you saw what i did i clicked on account okay and then if you go down okay you'll see because i have only one position i have only one position so can you guys see tcs at the bottom yes, sir. okay so i have only one position so it's showing only one okay so if you had five position it would show five stocks over there so you just have to move this slider down yeah okay so you can see can you see the unrealized pnl here so because i have only one position my unrealized pnl on tcs is the same as the uh, unrealized pnl on the total portfolio okay here all right 
okay so um, as you can see this this is the unrealized PNL okay and uh, this is the unrealized PNL on the total portfolio and then I don't know what this is I'll have to figure this out what this two one uh, total in USD okay yeah okay so yeah so you can see this unrealized PNL here can you see that so you'll get this picture from here so that will be a shortcut for you okay so in your blotter to save time you can have only your record of how many shares you sold or bought and what sh at what price and what was the cash utilization etc okay so this you can solve from here okay and you'll see unrealized plus a realize will give you the net liquidation value okay all right so this is one way of solving the problem okay now let's come to one more uh, now let's come to one more element of this as uh, of this problem okay now as you saw what happened here is as you saw what happened here is that uh, the uh, so in this case after buying TCS I bought it here and I put a stop here okay so luckily it did not it didn't go and hit the stop it went up uh, up and then there is a realized profit on this stop okay so now if you look at the cost the cost is also given to you here the average price of buying is also given to you here if you look at what is the average price 2101 okay 2101.12 okay so you can see that that means the stock was bought at 2101.12 which means visually you look at the chart because we are still trading mainly from a technical approach uh, from a technical analysis perspective so we're very focused on charts and so we look at the chart 2101 is somewhere here okay so which means we are long somewhere here okay at this level and the market is much higher now so what we can one of the things we can do is that uh, we can this is just one approach there are many ways to do it I can just continue to keep the stop I can continue to everybody understood why I kept the stop there yes because when you look at the um, if you look at uh, let's say four hours right we have already covered this that if the market went below this it would have actually destroyed the thesis of the uptrend it would have destroyed the view of the continuation of the uptrend because it would have made a lower low so the higher low condition would have been violated that's why the stop was placed here it's quite simple right you don't have to rack your brains over where to place the stop once you take a view you don't have to it's pretty simple if you are trading from a purely technical approach and it's a very simple technical method but it's a very powerful method okay so you should not be hesitant to use it but you see that it easily solves your problem you, you have to decide what time frame you are interested in of course okay but uh, if you take this kind of a time frame then it's pretty simple once you decide to buy at the, around this level then obviously a stop has to be placed here okay so that is pretty simple now you still have a choice even now you could continue to place the stop here okay that's one choice I'll just show you another option that you have because I want to introduce this idea of pyramiding now I'm zooming into the last part you saw what I did I went in from a one hour chart to zooming in to the last part of the movement now I can see a lot more detail because in that one hour chart it was showing just like a straight line I couldn't see all this up and down movement here which I see can I, I see can see a lot more movement here okay so one of the things I can do is uh, obviously one thing is to just keep that stop here the other thing that is what that can be done and you can split this up actually so how many shares do we have here 1000 shares okay so one option we have is that for 500 shares, just just a just a rough 50 50 slit you can do it in many other ways okay there are there's no one right solution i'm just giving you a simple example so i can split this 1000 share position into two positions okay now we are getting into the concept of trading on multiple time frames okay because if you are looking at technical trading if you are looking at refinements to technical trading you have to get comfortable with the idea of trading in multiple time frames okay by what, what do i mean by multiple time frames let's just look at <coughs> this i'll take you back to this uh, i've changed the market right now because i've placed an order here okay this is what market is this what market is this okay Aussie okay we call this spot Aussie that is understood that because the US dollar is the main uh, main currency uh, against which every other currency is traded so if we just say spot Aussie it means that it's AUD USD okay the other currency is quite obvious okay all right now if I wanted to mean AUD NZD I would say Aussie Kiwi okay so normally Aussie if I say spot Aussie that means because most currencies are traded against the US dollar the active trade is against the US dollar so if I say spot Aussie I have not mentioned the other currency yeah. 
I've only mentioned one currency, but it is understood that spot Aussie means that the other currency is US dollars. So spot Aussie means I'm referring to AUD USD. If I wanted to refer to AUD, NZ, AUD NZD, I would have to say Aussie Kiwi. Okay, if I wanted to refer to AUD CAD, I would have to say Aussie CAD. Okay, is this clear? Okay, so in the spot Aussie market here, okay, you can see this is the concept of multiple time frames. Here you can see this is a monthly chart. Okay, so if you had a view that uh, you know, if you had a view that you are uh, you want to go short, okay, you want to go short at market, we'll just simplify the entry decision and we'll decide that everything we want to do buy sell we do at market. And actually, it's a very simple decision. In the long run, your investment performance is never going to be affected really by this decision, whether you trade immediately at market or you trade at a slightly better level. Okay. Uh, in the long run, it's not going to be the decisive factor in your investment performance. The decisive factor is going to be how you manage the risk. Okay. Because you can always control the risk by sizing your position differently. Okay. So it's a very, uh, it's, it's a fairly reasonable thing to do to assume that for the sake of simplicity, we trade at market all the time. Okay. So now if I had to let, just look at this time frame, you can see there's a monthly chart. It's a very big time frame because it starts from 2002. Okay. This data range is from 2002. Okay. So it's a big time frame. I can see all these big moves on the monthly charts. So if I had to go short here at market, can you see that logically my stock would have to be here? Because this is actually this low has been broken. Okay. This low has been broken and we have a new low. <coughs> So can you see logically my stock would have to be here because I'm not looking at any other time frame. I'm, I have only one zoom available to me. Only one level of zoom. I can't zoom in anymore. In that case, can you see the stock would have to be here? That's the only other high I can see. Can you see that? Because I'm going short means if I'm going short, it means that I feel that the downtrend is going to continue uh, continue lower, which means higher lower highs and lower lows. Okay, so what would break the pattern? One of the things that would break the pattern is a higher high. So if I'm going short, I want to place my stop at the point where my assumption is invalidated. Is this clear? I'm going short, I'm taking a position based on a certain assumption. So I have to place my stop where my st assumption would be invalidated. Is this clear? So the, the stop would have to be here if all I can look at is this time frame. Is everyone clear about this? All are in agreement, Aurora? You are in agreement? Okay, good. Okay, so here we can see this price level is probably around eight, whatever it is, let's say 82. Let's say it's 82 cents. So my stop is at 82 cents and I'm going short at 68 cents. Okay, so that's a very big stop. That's a very wide stop. You can see that 68 to 82, that's a very big stop. Okay, so this is one level of doing it. Okay, so one of the things, so you can, but but this level is, this time frame is not irrelevant. Okay, this is of course relevant if there is such a big downtrend going on, which means in the short term also, you are going to see more downtrends than, than uptrends, right? If there's, if it's going to be a very, if there's going to be the wettest July in, in history, okay, if it's going to be the wettest July in history, then this more likely to rain on any given day than not to rain, right? More days are going to see rain than, uh, than are going to be dry, right? So similarly, if you have a big downtrend going on, even that means all the short term downtrends also, short term trends will also be biased towards the downside. Okay, so one of the things you can do is, of course, you can maintain a bearish view looked at looking at this big picture time frame. But also you can look at this. So if I can go short here, one of the things I can do is I can go short here with a stop over here. So this can be my big picture trade. Okay, so now we are going to talk about trading in two different time frames. Okay, so this can be my big picture trade. Okay, so I can have certain amount of capital devoted to this big picture trade. Okay, where I go short at 68 and I have this stop at 82. Okay, then I can also have simultaneously, I can also have now, this is a very long term time frame monthly charts. I try to zoom in and get some more detail here. Okay, I see this is the day weekly chart. I can see on the daily chart, it's a little bit better. Okay, so if I look at now, I'll just give you a simple example from the daily chart. Can you see if I look at the daily chart now, the same dark, this is basically what has happened here. It's just this understand the scheme of this layout It's what I showed you yesterday. Remember, we showed you this chart yesterday. Okay. What we see here is essentially nothing but how is the next chart constructed? The next chart is essentially is a zoom in to the last part of the previous chart. Can you see that? Yes, sir. Visually verify for yourself that this is true. 
the next chart is a zoom in to the last part of the previous chart so this is basically this part is blowing up these these two moves here okay again this one is actually blowing up this last part here is everyone following what has been done here because I'm increasing the granularity yes. so the data range is shifting so the thing is shifting in this way but it's actually zooming in more this is clear okay you are able to see more detail now here this just looks like a straight line now you start to see a little more detail and then when you come into the daily you can see a lot more detail now all this detail here down up down up down up down this was not visible on this chart yes. okay but it's already there in the market this is part of the historical record okay all right so when I go to the daily chart now I can do a I'm just going to take monthly and daily to give you an idea of big picture and short term picture and for the sake of brevity okay, the English is not nice but for the sake of brevity the short term picture we'll call it a small picture so it's very simple big picture and small picture okay but in practice when you're presenting to other people don't say small picture say short term picture okay so now here this is our big picture in the big picture time frame when I look at the big picture I go short at market we keep it simple and we go short always go short or long at market so I go short at 68 let's say 68 cents okay and my stop is at 82 okay in the big picture in the small picture when I'm doing a trade on the small picture okay some part of capital is uh, some part of my risk capital is devoted to this trade I again go short at 68 the price is the same but now can I put a stop at this level here this high here which seems to be somewhere around uh, 70 80 or something so around 70 well, let's call it 71 yeah. for the sake of uh, you know just uh, convenience let's call it 71 okay is everyone following what I'm pointing at okay so now 68 to 71 is better than 68 to 82 is it a little better yeah. so if I have the same amount of risk capital committed to both the positions okay so my big picture uh, trading has some amount of risk capital and my small picture trading has some amount of risk capital then on the uh, small picture trade I can use a larger position size is everyone following because the size of the stop is much less let's just do it here on your uh, let's just do it on your um, calc file did everyone understand what I said yes. has everyone understood conceptually what I'm talking about now trading in different time frames <coughs> by setting up different types of charts forget about the fact that for your Indian equities operationally you can't set up these charts right now but conceptually when you're learning finance we are not just going to learn based on what we can do in Indian equities we are going to learn about what we what can be done globally right so otherwise you won't learn the concepts okay is everyone following this concept of trading in multiple time frames that I have a big picture view and a small picture view yes Ritesh you don't seem convinced are you following okay so two different time frames we are going to trade in two different time frames is this clear okay so one big picture time frame I'm using a big stop loss which is from 68 is my entry point and 82 is my stop okay so let's say that I can afford to we still go back to your calc speed spreadsheet okay we can actually use um, this okay where we are talking uh, about okay so let's just keep it here okay um, so let's say I'm risking only a thousand dollars we may have to increase this okay so what is my entry price 68 68 cents okay so just remember that is cents okay right now okay so 68 cents and my exit is 82 cents okay so I'm losing 0.14 per uh, uh, per Aussie okay 0.14 uh, cents per Aussie and what is my um, this is so we will okay let's use uh, so here this shows you that you can afford to trade this has been adjusted against uh, we have not used the wrong turn brokerage but that's okay we we don't need to use the wrong turn brokerage yeah okay so is everyone following I don't want to set up this formula once again so let's just do it here is everyone following what we are doing yes. so I said that my risk per trade is only one thousand dollars 
So on both the big picture trading and for one uh, small picture trading, my risk capital is the same, and we are using the same number of uh, we are using the same percentage here. This one percent, okay? This is actually something that has to be determined, but we are just taking one percent as a figure. So one thousand is what I can risk on each trade, whether it's a big picture trade or a small picture trade, okay? So here because these entry uh, the entry price is uh, entry price sixty eight cents eighty two is the exit price. So I can afford to risk. I can afford to trade only about uh, you know one eleven hundred sixty two dollars sixty three dollars okay that can be my position size if i do that then i will not lose more than i will lose only one thousand dollars if the stop is triggered is everyone following okay so all we are saying is and everyone has the concept of two to two time frames one is a big picture time frame is a small picture okay your small picture can actually be much smaller okay but we are just for the sake of simplicity we are stopping at daily so i have a slightly smaller picture here and daily i'm setting the stop at let's say 71 okay is everyone clear are you following okay so this time now remember here we had this we are just going to copy paste this and we are going to do a paste special paste special and values only okay so that was what we could afford to do on the previous trade all i'm saying is my entry remains the same my risk remains the same but my exit is different okay so exit is 71 okay so all we are saying is here that how is the position 1030 1162 how is this happening <laughs> we how is this have this is counterintuitive because we should be able to trade a larger size let me see what the position is let me see what the formula is okay anyway let me uh, let's not break our head over this right now but conceptually you understand let's let's let me write a different formula okay uh, entry exit okay let's write um, because this doesn't make any sense i know why it's uh, this is happening actually one sec uh, let's just do it one more time okay okay and uh, the position size Okay. All right. So we have an entry at um, 0.68. Okay. The way the formula has been written, maybe 0.82. Okay. And we have an entry at 0.68, and we have an exit at 0.71. Okay. So the loss is in each of these cases. The loss is basically uh, equal to. Okay, let's just take the absolute value of the loss, which is uh, 82 minus. Okay, so here we are losing 14 cents, and here we are. Let me just copy this. Okay, here. So the position here we're losing only three cents. Okay, and so here what we are saying is uh, this should be. What is my risk per trade? You are once again getting an idea of how to figure out position size. So only you look very troubled. Are you following? Your expression is very, it's like you are in great distress. Are you following what's going on? Okay. Okay. So here I'm taking thousand dollars as my risk. Okay. That's what I can afford to lose. And per, uh, per one Aussie I am losing. 14 cents okay so how many Aussie can I uh, how many uh, how much Aussie can I afford to uh, take okay uh, this is my position here okay and the same thing should apply here if I take a thousand dollars and um, we may have a problem so one minute this we shall have okay now you see it makes more sense because if i'm losing only three cents per aussie then i can afford to and if the total risk is the same in both cases then i can afford to trade in much bigger size in the second case okay this is clear yes. everyone is following that's all i was trying to say it's a simple problem but anyway at least we went through this exercise okay is everyone clear yes. okay so this is how we so you get a refresher on how to figure out the position size once you have determined the uh, the, uh, the uh, risk on the trade so another very important lesson that you learn which many sometimes even professionals don't follow is many professional I because I've been on professional on trading desks interbank uh, trading desks where people decide the position size uh, almost exo exogenously you understand what is an exogenous variable 
it's an exogenous variable is a what dependent or independent independent, independent. exogenous variable is independent so people used to decide the uh, ex the position size as an independent variable exo exogenous variable but that is not correct actually it's not smart risk management the position size is actually a dependent variable dependent on other factors like maximum risk per trade okay entry price exit price so it's it's derived mechanically from those parameters it's not something to be let's take some so it's not you don't should not decide the position size by uh, with that kind of arbitrary logic you know so uh, this is how most people trade they just decide the position size it falls from the sky okay so it should be determined in a systematic way in this manner this is how you control your risk okay so is this clear everyone okay so all we are saying now is we have two time frames we are talking about two time frames so i'm going to put this into play so that you understand how to so these are some refinements to technical trading which you can learn about okay and hopefully you can put it into place okay so we have thousand shares okay where which we bought at 2101 and now this thing is going up so what can we do about it let's look at what we can do about it with with this idea of multiple time frames okay so what are we going to do we are going to keep 500 shares and this is an arbitrary split and you can have many other ways of figuring this out okay so we're going to keep 500 shares with the original stop okay so we bought it around 2101 so we keep 500 shares with the original stop so our initial risk whatever we took okay so let's just say this is 2030 let's say let's say we can just do this exercise through the uh, so that you have a so i bought it at 2101 okay and um, and we had 2030 and i bought uh, let's say 500 i'm applying to that okay so here my uh, i'm losing 2030 minus this okay and here i'm losing okay so i'm losing 35 about 36000 is this clear is this clear everyone what I'm, are you following what i'm doing okay i am maintaining my uh, out of my thousand shares i've split it arbitrarily into two parts okay i am going to now so now we are talking about how to manage profitable positions how to manage losing positions is pretty clear you just put the stop and then you wait and see what happens okay i only two things can happen either it goes and stops you out in which case you start again the whole cycle starts again okay you have no position now repeat the whole analytical cycle and go through it again okay but if it moves in your favor then how do you manage the profit okay that also can be done in a systematic manner it's not just that uh you have some profit it looks good and you just take the profit okay usually that's what happens people don't cut the losses but they take the profits quickly okay as soon as you see the profit you take the profit but that's not how it should be done it should be the opposite actually it should be opposite so what we are doing is we are keeping half the position on the original stop so now you realize this is a big picture trade Yes, compared to what we are going to do now just take my word for it this is a big picture trade okay so for the uh, for half the position i maintain the original stop okay it's big picture because it was based on a, a one hour chart or four hour chart remember that that i took the view on the four hour chart okay so so half remains and so i've got a risk of um i've got a risk of about thirty six thousand on that trade so if that goes against me then i'll eventually lose thirty six thousand. now what happens with the other trade what am i going to do where is this okay now can you suggest some other stop now if i want to go to the small picture so if this is the big picture this is a big picture stop okay what are the possible small picture stops can you see anything one is here okay this is one stop because from here you had although technically we haven't had a new high but it's a fairly well-defined low in the market because it's from here you have seen a big bounce yes. so logically you could be this could be one stop okay but logically another because this time frame is is almost similar to this because the big picture the small picture has to be uh, materially smaller than the big picture okay so why is this not the best other stop because you have one stop over here why is this not the best other stop because this is pretty much the same time frame let's look at the chart once again let's look at a one hour chart once again can you see that if i place it here it's pretty much the same time frame 
they both seem like big picture moves are you following what i'm saying that if i have a big picture okay if you have a big picture if i have a big picture trade and i have a small picture trade okay the small picture should be materially smaller than the big picture yes. is that a reasonable statement yes. like if i'm having a meal if i'm having a full meal and then i'm making a distinction i'm saying i'm just having a snack if the snack is the same size as the meal then there's no point right so why call it a snack then it's less a meal so if i'm saying a big small picture then it's reasonable to say that the small picture should be a reasonably a, a materially smaller time frame are you following what i'm saying okay so then if we place it here it's still visible on the early charts both are both the lows are visible on the early charts so they seem like pretty much on the time same time frame yeah. so it's not really a small picture stock but what we can do is we can go back to let's zoom into this part here let's zoom into this part here and go into a 15 minute chart okay now can you see something on the small picture charts short time shorter time frame charts can we find a better stop anybody any ideas give me a rough level by looking at the scale so the stop above 2270 above 2270 double zero very good right so what uh, tanya is pointing to is this point yes tanya is pointing to this low you can see here there is a low here Okay, as soon as I go there, you can no longer see the low, but this is the low here that she's pointing to. Is this clear? Yeah. Okay. Right. So this is logical because if you look at the short-term trend, this is again, if it goes below this level, it will destroy the short-term uptrend. Yes. Can you see that there is a long-term uptrend here, which you saw on the early charts, but there is also a short-term uptrend here, from starting from here, high, then low, but higher than this low. then again higher high this high this high is higher than this one then you had another low here which is higher than this one are you following is everyone following the points i'm hi highlighting are pretty much this, the everyone would agree with this these things okay so then again we have a new high here okay so uh, and then what you have is you have a new high over here and then you have this this high has also been broken and this so if it goes below this this will break the pattern of higher highs and higher lows so it will destroy or neutralize the short term downtrend so if you are trading from with a small picture perspective this is a reasonable place to place the stop is this clear so now you have the concept of protecting some part of your profit okay that what you can do is remember we bought 1000 shares so we are keeping only 500 shares against this stop which means we still have a balance 500 right yes. okay so what we can do is we can place a stop for the balance 500 over here are you following yes sir why is this a stop order why is this not a limit sell order anybody wants to is my question clear no. because what is the what is my entry price 2101 okay my entry price is 2101 and i'm selling at 22 let's call it 2205 let's say for the sake of argument we don't want to spend time reading off the actual value but let's say it's 2205 so if i bought something at 2101 and i'm selling it at 2205 am i going to lose money no no i'm making money so that's why now you understand one more thing why i kept on telling you from the time we first used the expression stop loss that the technical term in the system language and in the proper language uh, proper language of finance also the technical term is only stop order the technical term doesn't have a stop loss stop loss is just a layman's uh, term that we use and it's applicable at the time that you initially put on the trade because when i initially put on the trade i entered at 2101 and i would have exited at whatever 2030 and that would have been a loss okay so even though it technically remained a stop order in a layman sense if you called it a stop loss it would not have been inaccurate because it would have stopped your losses is this clear initially it's valid but the technical term is stop order even here it is correctly called a stop order okay and now let's go back and revise the concept of a stop order so now what i'm telling you is that we place this order to sell at 2205 okay we assume that 2205 is the new low we place this order for 500 shares okay we place a stop order at 2205 okay and why is it still called a stop order because it's clearly no longer a stop loss is that clear everyone yeah. it's no longer a stop loss 
but why is it still okay to call it a stop order? So because you are expecting the right prices to Mike, Mike, use the mic. Although you don't need it, but let's have the discipline of using the mic. Who is working on the mic? Okay. Okay, so let's... Yes, Bharat, why is it... Is my question clear? Yes. My entry is at 2101. My exit, I want to I want to sell, this is the instruction I'm giving to the system is, I want to sell 500 shares at 2205, okay? I want to sell 500 shares at 2205. When I enter this, I'm entering it as a stop order. Why is it still a stop order? So because you are, uh, you are expecting to be the price to uh, rise from those levels. But uh, at, pro at setting the stop at that level, you are uh, maximizing your profit, not minimizing them. Because you think that the price will rise from there onwards. But in case the price is falls, I want the maximum profit. No, no, it's not a good answer. Minimizing the loss. No, let's give it to Chuk. My question is clear to everyone. Yes. It's a very specific question. Why is it still called a stop order? Yes, Chuk. Sir, I don't think it will be a stop order. Okay. I think it will be a limit order. Okay. Because while we were uh, discussing the concept of placing bracket orders, we discussed uh, the, li uh, the limit order and uh, using stop order together. So, where you said that limit sell, uh, limit buy means buying it at a price lesser than the market price, and limit sell means selling at a price higher than the current market price. So we are placing a limit that I have bought at this and I want the limit to be 225. Whenever it touches that, it should sell. One minute, one minute. I, no, but you're make you're confusing something here. The the bracket orders are placed at the time of placing the initial limit order to buy. So remember this: the bracket order is only going to happen if uh, if you buy at uh, the bracket order is when I'm buying. The bracket order is only valid when I am placing a limit order. Let's say I place a limit order to buy at 2101. I haven't bought it yet. Okay or even after I've just bought it I place the bracket order at that time there's a limit sell order above it to take profit okay and then there's a limit uh, then there's a stop order below it okay this is clear are you following Chuk. so what if there's the, a market buy and then the limit sell and also a stop sell the bracket this system is not letting you order enter bracket orders with market orders okay either you already have a position and then you add bracket orders or typically you add at the time of entering the position trying to enter the position with a limit order you also add bracket orders so that after the limit order to enter is executed then the brackets go into effect remember the question that Garved asked that if or who somebody else asked that question maybe Tanya asked that question that if your limit order is not executed hey Garved asked that question that if your limit order is not executed when you're trying to buy let's say you're trying to buy at 2160 and if it is bought at 2160 you want to sell at 2300 and if it's going down you want to sell at 2120 what he is saying it if it what garvid was asking is if it never comes to 2160 but straight away goes to 2300 will your limit order to sell at 2300 be activated the answer was no because the brackets only come come to life once the initial limit order is act executed this is clear so your question i understand why the confusion but remember the bracket orders are only entered with positions that have just been en entered into or with with a limit order which is meant to put you into the position in the first place okay here it's a different situation i already have the position i already have the position from much before uh, much uh, much earlier okay now i'm placing for i'm splitting this position into two it's like i bought two lots of 500 shares okay one lot i'm keeping a stop over here okay and one lot i'm keeping a stop over here this is clear all right so now my question is why is this second lot for which i'm putting a stop over here at 2205 okay why is it a stop order it is a take profit order no, it doesn't answer my question of why is it a stop order why is it not a market order why is it not a limit order why is it a stop order okay what is oh your time is i think one sec what is it let's confirm it okay yeah yeah you can go you can go okay okay all right guys now is my question clear why is it a stop order? What is so complicated about this? Sir, you answer it logically. Yes. Give it the give the mic to Tarun. 
how do you how do you answer this kind of a question why is it a stop order okay you first find out what are the properties of a stop order if this order exhibits the properties of a stop order then it's a stop order it's a simple question it's the same for any question right if i ask you why how do you know that puneet is a human being you have one you have a computer you have a comparison how are you logically answering that question okay you have on this side you have what are the properties of a human being and then you look at puneet okay he has two hands two legs okay he talks in a human language okay so then you check off all the marks and then you say okay he is exhibiting the characteristics of a human being so he must be a human being right so the same way you answer any other question why is this a stop order you look at the characteristics of a stop order and you see whether this order has the characteristics of a stop order if it has then it's a stop order right so now who is going to use the framework and answer this question yes tarun my question is clear yes, why is this order to sell the 500 shares which i bought over here when i'm going to sell uh, or put an order to sell it here and the market is here right now why is it a stop order and not a limit order or take profit order or something like that this stop uh, is always a uh, property where you want to actually one minute one minute your... this i have to cut marks for uh, for uh, surbi and uh, hardik because you guys and next time we we'll have to put surbi somewhere we we'll have to suspend her from the ceiling or something <laughs> she's talking to everybody when garvid is there she's stop turning that side she <laughs> One minute. No, we have to we have to take some drastic measures for so for Sulbi because she is talking too much. Okay. We we'll have to go short Sulbi basically. That is what we need to do. No, no. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No, sorry. What were we saying? Uh, yes, uh, Tarun. What are, What are you saying? One minute. Yeah. Short. Go ahead. Go ahead. So we place a uh, stop when uh, we are we want to prove that our assumption that we are put in the market is uh, wrong. So okay. actually, what you are trying to do is uh, you are now uh, trying to assume that your market will not go up, uh, up again from this position where you are prevailing right now, and uh, whereas the market will now fall. So now downtrend has uh, started, and now you want to minimize your loss. So now you are putting a stop order rather than a any limit order. No, you are not really answering my question. What you are saying is you are justifying why. the uh, stop order should be at this level what you are answering your uh, your answer is actually answering the question of why should the order to exit this 500 shares why should it be at this level why should the stop trigger be at this level that's what you are answering so okay let's give it to tanya let's give it to tanya is everyone clear about my question yes sir yes. very simple why is it a stop order why is it not a limit order and why is, i'm giving you a hint over here straight away what are the properties i've already told you the framework why is something a part of this you see what are the properties of stop orders and see the property of this order is it matching the properties of a stop order then it's a stop order the stop order generally is the price less favorable than the market price so that is why it is a stop order our favorable market price would be the current market price that is 262 to 27 something the top price yeah 2267 let's say it is a stop order it is a stop order because it will offer a price less favorable than the market okay, price okay fine you have not phrased it well but she has understood the point this is how you should answer this question it is a stop order because first of all you have to go back and recap what are the properties of a stop order okay so um, as i told you a stop order is a conditional market order okay market order if and when okay this tells you that this is actually a conditional market order okay it's a conditional market order okay a sell stop order is always below the market price a buy stop order is always above the current market this is the characteristic of a stop order okay what did we say here when we looked at stop orders when we briefly covered stop orders hmm. this has become a little bit uh, we can just reduce the uh, font size a little bit yeah so this is how we covered it we should you should already remembered all this stuff now okay is everyone able to see this 
when you are entering a trade very simple nobody should have ever forgotten this after that class. you don't even have to revise the stuff it's so simple three types of orders market orders limit orders this basically shows that you're not thinking you're not sufficiently engaged in the class okay your maybe your mind is here and there once you remember this what is so com uh, complicated about this there are three types of orders you learnt about market orders stop orders limit orders and they are all being distinguished with respect to only one type of uh, feature which is is the execution through this order happening at a price equal to better than or uh, better than or worse than the market price instead of better than and worse than we have used less favorable and more favorable uh, more favorable and less favorable is this clear so what is so complicated about this this is something you should have just wrapped up and just filed away in your brain and it should be always accessible and you're not able to answer it smoothly okay simple the answer to this question is a stop order is one in which the execution occurs at a price less favorable than the current market price so in this case i'm because my position what is my position here long or short no long here right we went long here you can see in the system the position is thousand shares long okay so it's long so in when i'm going to uh, put in a profit protection order which basically takes me out of the position at a point when there's some weakness in the market right so uh, it basically takes me out of the market at some point where my assumption is wrong in this case we are this is a small picture trade we have done the big picture trade with respect by using this stop now we are doing a small picture trade so when with respect to the small picture also my when my trend view is invalidated it will take me out of the market so if it's going to take me out of the market it has to be a sell order or a buy order it has to be a sell order because my position is long is this clear are you following yes. at any point if you don't follow then you should ask a question that i'm not able to follow so what is the logic my original position is long yes. and 500 shares i've already taken care of through the long big picture stop i've spread it in now i've got 500 shares for the other lot which i have okay so that thousand shares then we split into two lots now that for five other lot i'm trading on a small picture view this is clear so with the small picture view i took a view i looked at the small short term trend 15 minute charts i see another uptrend going on here okay so i want to exit if the short term uptrend is also in place then why should i get out right i should stay in in, in the position as long as a short because this is a short term trade now it's a small picture trade <coughs> are you following so on the small picture also i can see an uptrend here is this clear i can see an uptrend here so i only want to get out if the my position is long which means i'm betting on a continuation of the uptrend right you're betting on a, that's how we use the language right so if you're betting that uh, you know if you're betting on india in a sports game that means you're betting that india will win the match yes, here if i'm putting on a long position that means i'm betting that the uptrend will continue okay so when is my assumption invalidated as tanya pointed out correctly at this point 2205 because that destroys the pattern of higher lows and higher highs on the small picture are you following so therefore my long position which is the bet on a continuation of the uptrend should be taken out if we go below this are you following okay so therefore what if i want to be taken out of my position it has to be a sell order okay so i have to place a sell order at 2205 let's say now when i want to place a sell order at 2205 how do i know is it a stop order is it a limit sell order and that's where you go back to the definition of orders this you should remember very clearly maybe initially you can memorize it but you should also understand it conceptually so you have the concept of the market price which is very clear then you have cons you you can either trade at the market price or you can trade at a price more favorable than the market price or less favorable and how are we talking about so if you're trading at the market then it's a market order if you're trading at the market price then it's a market order if you're trading at a price less favorable than the market price then it's a stop order, stop order. okay notice we use a general terminology less favorable than the market that's we don't say lower or higher because less favorable if it's if you're selling then uh, uh, lower is less favorable but if you're buying lower is more favorable so we don't want to use loaded language like higher or lower we want to use general language like less favorable or more favorable is this clear yes. so whenever your situation is such your situation is such that you are set you are transacting at a price less favorable than the current market then it's a stop order 
if you are transacting at a price more favorable, if you are going to end up transacting at a price more favorable than the current market, then it's a what? More favorable than the current market. Limit order. This is clear. So you should never forget this stuff. It's 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 funny that we are wasting time once again about this should have been completely internalized internalized in the last session itself. This is clear to everyone. So what is happening here? Once again, you go back to my question. When I'm putting in an order to sell at 2205 and the current market is 2263, how should your brain be working here? I've got an order to sell at 2205 when the market is at 2261. Okay, I could sell if I if I sell at 2261, it's much better for me. If I'm going to sell at 2205, then it's much less favorable than the current market. So this is an order to sell at a price less favorable than the current market. So then it's a stop, stop. stop order. Is this clear? Yes. This is how you should work it out logically. Okay. So this is what. So this is a stop order. Okay. So now you have understood the concept of. Uh, we still have three minutes, so we can cover a little more ground. Okay. So now we understood the concept of. Uh, are you getting the picture of uh, idea of two time frames? Yes. Okay. Trading in two time frames, a big picture and small picture. Okay. So the big picture obviously will move much more slowly. The small picture is moving around much more because this thing could come down here. Okay. It could come below 2205, but not go below this. Are you are you able to see that possibility? Yes. yes. It's possible. It can go down here, go up and down many times, lots of volatility, but doesn't even go below this. Forget about this. So eventually, maybe it comes to 2120 and then turns around and starts going up again. So you will be stopped out of your small picture trade, but you will still be in the big picture trade. That's how you. That's why you have this concept of trading in multiple time frames so that you don't get stopped out of the full position by short term volatility. Are you able to follow what I'm saying? So now you have to start thinking these are, these are refinements to technical trading. Okay, where you can, but you can see how precise you can uh, look, uh, trade, how, how precise you can get in your approach. Can you see that? Yes. So these are very precise and these are very objective. Okay, these are very objective criteria because if I have six people in a team, it's not six people may have different subjective views, but there's nothing subjective about this. If we follow this trend, it's pretty clear. I think you'll agree that all six people will agree that these are the lows. This one, this one, this one, and this one. Yes. You agree? Yes. On this time frame, people will say this is the high, this is the high, this is the high, and then we have a new high. We don't know where it's exactly established. Is everyone clear? Okay, everyone's gonna say that, right? So now you can see, so now we can have a stop over here. So what we would go with, we would change this stop. This stop would change to 500 shares. Okay, and I would transmit it. Okay, for your benefit, we can see we have 10 seconds left. Okay, all right. Then what I would do is I would also should I hit the bid or the offer? I want to place another stop sell order. Yes, bid or the offer? Sell 500. Okay, should be day or GTC? GTC is always better. This has to be a stop order. Okay, now you see what I've done. Oh, this price has to be okay. The price has to change. Yes, sir. What is the price? 2205. We said, yes, sir. okay, now we now we can transmit. Okay, your time is up now. We have transmitted it. Okay, we override and transmit. Okay, now you've got two orders running. Now you can see. So you learn something today. Yes, sir. Okay, and you revise certain things. So now you get the idea of trading in multiple time frames. Okay. All right. Okay. Your class is dismissed. Anybody has technical questions? You can come here. Any technical questions? The phone phone culprits can take your phone. Now you have to design a cage. Next time we have to put Sorbi in a cage so that she can't talk to anyone. No, we have to, uh, we have to put a suspender from the ceiling. Any technical question? I'm closing the video. See the video on interactive brokers. See the video on interactive brokers. There's a video. Uh, look, see their traders university or uh, tutorials. See the website. IB website. Go to the IB website. No, you don't need a login. No, no, you don't need a login. 
you go to the interactive brokers website you don't need a login and search for short selling they have a tutorial you can search from there or you can just navigate under education navigate under education okay so I'm closing this oh no one has any questions because it's too late now right